here's what's interesting, Mark. Murder, committing adultery, and cursing your mother, father, right? We lose any one of those things in our society. We start breaking them down and look what we have outside, right? How unfaithful people are today, the problems that creates in the world. Murder, people killing for just to, to get ahead, to make money, to make profit, to take advantage, to control, to consume, you know, and even just like the position of parents. How weak have parents become? Mm -hmm. We're all broken. And God's saying you lose one of those three things, society rips apart. <laughs>
a week and a half. You didn't even restock the shelves? You just clean the no, shelves? No, I just clean the shelves. So I'd literally <laughs> like go to the drama section. I'd move it to one side. I'd move the dust. I'd put it back. I'd clean the other side. And I'd, it would take me like a week and a half to clean the whole store. And I'd just have to start again because dust just kept coming back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was, like, it was like the never ending story. Yeah. Um, and the, the one advantage of that is the managers, because I was just, you know, a 12 year old kid working illegally. Um, I, they let me pick movies to watch. So I'd start watching like, you know, I just kind of like started watching DiCaprio movies at first, you know, This Boy's Life, Romeo and Juliet, you know, and everything that he'd sort of done as a kid. And I thought, oh, wow. Like, how cool would it be to be an actor in Hollywood one day, you know? And, and it was, you know, and I sort of started doing theater with that. And um, it was just one of those things that slowly progressed. I got a scholarship with um, ATYP, which is the Australian Theater for Young People. And I started doing that after school on, on certain days. and. And then I got commercials and, you know, did bits and pieces. And the, the States was always just like this distant dream. It was right. never, never a It's very far. I mean, yeah. LA, to, LA to Australia is a very far yeah, flight. Yeah, it's crazy. So, you know, I did a couple of TV shows in Australia. And what ended up happening is I couldn't get work because, you know, acting is not like a full-time job where you can just like, you know, walk, walk into a job whenever you wish. You're kind right. of living in the hands of other people's, um, you know, decisions based on your ability and the way you look. So I started working as a host on this Disney Channel show in Australia. And um, I was just hosting a kid's show where we'll go, hey, coming up next is Kim Possible. Like, blah, 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 <laughs> you know, like living that, like, you know, wholesome life. Um, <laughs> and then um, the girl that I was working with, she was always just like, oh, like I, I do the trips because she was there longer than me. And um, it turned out that she wanted to do this Melbourne trip. So that she said, I'm doing the Melbourne trip. You, you, you're going to stay here. And I was like, yeah, no worries. And then like a week later, um, an LA trip came up and because she had gone down to Melbourne, she couldn't do it. So I went to LA to interview all the Disney Channel celebrities. And, you know, I was interviewing. Was she pissed? I, I reckon she would have been, yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, what <clears throat> unfolded from that was kind of interesting. So I went and did this interview with um, Alison Mashaka, who's an American actor. And at the end of the interview, her manager was like, oh my gosh, you guys had so much chemistry. That was amazing. It's too bad you're not an actor. You, you know, she's doing this pilot. You'd be so great for it. And I was like, oh, well. I, I am an actor. I'm yeah, just yeah. like hosting, you know, to make a bit of cash. And she's like, oh, would you be able to audition for this this show? And I was like, I only have one day off and it's tomorrow. So I ended up jumping in a cab. She sends me this audition. I go to this audition and I had no idea what I was doing at this point mm -hmm. in America because it's a really dis different system. You know, I meet this casting director and, and she's just, you know, she hears my American accent and she's like, oh, oh my God. So you wow, had the wow, American wow. accent wow. already? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It was just, you know, there. So she's like, okay, you're going to jump in a cab and you're going to go see these producers. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I, mean, I just auditioned. Like, isn't that enough? Like, yeah, yeah. in Australia, you just only go into the audition once and that's it. You're done. Mm -hmm. So she sends me over to this these producers and they have a bit of a freak out and then I end up testing for this this Disney Channel show but at this point I'm like I think I'm like 24 years old or something and you know Alison Shark is like 16 and I think Disney yeah. Channel is like mm, <laughs> age gap's a little tough to play the love interest so I didn't end up getting that but what what happened was these agents had heard that I'd tested for this show and they ended up calling me and saying oh would you be interested in coming back for a pilot season um, I got in a lot of trouble off Disney Channel for going to that audition but then like, oh, okay. I feel like because the head of Disney was like, no, no, no. Like I decide what happens. So he called my, <laughs> my boss in Australia. was like, yeah, no, this kid. Oh, you got in trouble back in Australia. Yeah. Cause they're like, what are you doing? You know, you're, uh, you're were you represented back there? Well, I mean, no, I got in trouble cause I was supposed to be here just working. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I'm going off trying to like, you know, so it kind of was one of those things. But um, from the back of that, I just thought, okay, well I got an agent and I, I had no money. I had no money. And they said, would you come out back out for a pilot season? So I ended up quitting Disney channel, taking the risk and going, okay, I'm going to just like roll the dice, come out for this pilot season. I ended up coming out for my first pilot season when it was like, you know, I was auditioning for like um, Friday Night Lights and stuff like that. Oh, wow. And um, I broke my ankle in, a, in an LA fitness gym playing basketball. Oh, and during was, pilot season. During pilot season. So I was on crutches at the very beginning. I was like, this is just ruined everything. And obviously walking into a room to audition for something and you're on crutches, they're just like, yeah, yeah. no. Nah. Um, so I was crushed. I was crushed. And I kind of thought, oh, this is horrible. So I went back to Australia, saved a ton of money, worked like three different jobs came back to the states did another pilot season and i like and i remember coming back to the states and i just this is like when you realize how ruthless uh america can be with actors so my agent was like yeah come back everything's great blah 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 i land in la and i call him and he's like yeah we let you go because oh, we, we haven't seen you for like you know six months i'm like i'm australian and i had to go home and save money and i'm you know yeah so they let me go so i ended up convincing this agent i said look get me a few auditions and just give me two and if I don't do amazing with these two auditions, um, you can get rid of me. You can let me go. 
So he, he ended up getting me this audition and I ended up testing for another show. And they were like, oh, great, you're back. Yeah, we love you again. And oh, then I was okay. like, you know what, guys? I'm letting you go. Because yeah. I, I went to another agency and then I just tested and tested and tested and tested. And I ended up testing for so many different shows, getting so close and not getting them. Um, and it was like a three-year ordeal where I was sleeping on people's couches. I was riding my bike to auditions. I had no money. Did you have a visa? Uh, no. No. Just like a tourist visa. No, I was just on a tourist visa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, U.S. immigration. If you're listening to this, I was just want to say that I'm I'm completely legal now, <laughs> and I did do it the correct way. But, you know, like come on, man. <laughs> this is the American dream, right? Right. Um. So what ended up happening was, um, I was just like, I can't get a job. I ran out of money, and I remember like I was at a, I was at Chick Fil A on uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. Okay, I'm or, very familiar Sunset, with this. Yeah, <laughs> Sunset Boulevard, right? And I was like, oh well, I'm done. This acting dream has been three years. I've got. So you gave up? I was at, yeah. I was like, I was about to call my mom and be like, I just need to get some money to get home. This is this is obviously not going to happen. And I got a phone call from um, my agent at the time, and he was like, Hey, you got a job, and you start in like a couple of weeks. And I was like, I haven't even auditioned for anything. How could I have got a job? Because um, the week before, I, I tested for another show, um, which was called like The Secret Circle or something, and um, one of the casting directors had seen my tape and he was like oh my gosh you look so much like um daniel gillies who, who plays you know in in the vampire diaries and they were looking for family members for this original family so they ended up offering it to me because i tested for vampire diaries in the very beginning so mm -hmm. i tested for stefan um and paul wesley obviously got that job and then you know i'd been in the mix for some other other characters on that so it it was one of those things where they just eventually gave it to me um, which was cool. And it was like that moment where I was like, oh, I was so close to just like, right. Like life would have been so different, you know? You'd be um, back in Australia right I'd now. I'd be back in Australia. Cleaning surfboards and dust. Cleaning surfboards. <laughs> Instead yeah. of the blockbuster. Talking to hot chicks on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So then I sat on the show and it was just like, a kind of like. But how did that work? Because you didn't have your visa. So how did. Well, how, that, that, they got oh, okay. the, the visa was gone through by that point. Got yeah, you, got yeah. you. So I got, I finally got the visa because you need a, you know, a deal memo. Is right. one of the big things. So you got, you got, I got my deal memo and. So how many, how many auditions would you say you went on before you booked your first oh, role? In America? Yeah. <sighs> I mean, lost count. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, we're talking like so many. I mean, I, I tested for like. How does that hit 15, your ego? Not shows. your ego, but you mentally. Man, it's, it, that's that's the challenge, isn't it? Like that's the challenge is anyone who's trying to do something that is extremely difficult to do is like, how long can I hold out for? How long can I convince myself that this is what I'm supposed to be doing? Right. You know, and I've met so many people who have given up and, and quit. And um, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's just life, isn't it? You know, it's one of those things where you just like, you realize like, you know, if I love it and I'm passionate about it, I can keep pushing, but it is a mental game. Everything is a mental game at a certain point. And I think the world that we live in is, you know, you know, you walk out your door and you kind of face with like that sort of challenge every single day, you know? Ba -ba -da! Yo, guys, I interrupt this episode to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Blinkist. We've talked about them many times before, guys. I've been really into reading lately. But if you don't have the time to read, they summarize and give you like all the information from thousands of nonfiction books and condense them out of just 15 minutes so you can read or listen to them. That way you don't have to spend hours or days reading a book. I like Blinkist because it has some of my favorite books on there. Becoming by Michelle Obama. I actually have this book, uh, Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House. If you guys want to talk uh, politics, start with Why by Simon Sinek, Emotional Intelligence. I have actually a hard copy of that book. But like I said, you guys can listen to them in just 15 minutes using Blinkist right now for a limited time. Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash large to start your seven day free trial. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash large to start your seven day free trial. So, because back then, 2000, that was like 2000. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been in the States for 10 years. Yeah, yeah so... There wasn't really social media happening. No, nothing like you that. You couldn't really do it yourself. No, 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 no. It was it was it was an old school system. Now it's all changed. Yeah. Now you can you know you can you can do so much for yourself and you can create your own sort of um, you can create your own life if you really really want with you know YouTube and and Instagram and you see that today. But like back then you had to work. Yeah. And you had to hope that someone else would see your value. You what do you what how do you see social media? Yeah, it's great. I think it's great. I think, it, look, anything in excess is dangerous, um, you know, and I think the, the, the biggest problem we have with social media today is every single influencer is enlightened and they come from a place where they think they've got everything worked out. But then when you meet these people, they're so broken. Yeah. And what the, 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 the advice they're offering the world is the advice they don't even take in their own life. Right. So it becomes quite false. And I think, you know, um, 
I think a lot of people are probably cluing into that and I think that that plays into like this world like you know before we started this you know this chat today I was talking about how I don't believe in self-love and I believe that social media is pushes self-love to an extreme where you see all these big influences and the first thing they'll say is you know hey guys what's that you got you got to love yourself today I want you to wake up and I want you to know you're beautiful you're special and you should love yourself and I'm like I asked the question where do you get that from and why do you say that and how do you think that's going to affect this generation because the reality is when we look at social media, we see a glimpse of life and we present our best, we put our best foot forward, put our best photo forward, we edit it, we make it look amazing, we fit it into our timeline and we <laughs> say these beautiful things. But if it doesn't come from a place of truth and it doesn't come from a place that I've really experienced and I understand the complexities of the human condition and what we struggle with every single day, then it's just a lie and it's not going to do anything for anyone. And I see that in this generation, these young people today. I do conventions all the time, I travel the world, and I've never seen so much brokenness because we're being lied to constantly, because we're being told we have to love ourselves. And the problem is, there's a certain point when you can't love yourself because it's, I feel like it's an impossibility, and then you failed at yet another thing. And that's what brings people into this deep, dark depression. And, and we look at it, and like, like I was saying to you, you know, the message of self-love is out, and everybody's talking about it yet the, the rate of depression is skyrocketing. So if we have the message, why is it not working? And, it's, and I believe it's because it's an impossibility. Now, value is really, really important. And, and I don't wanna confuse those two things. Self-love and value are very, very different. But here's the thing. I think most people, they're gonna, they're gonna gain their value from two places only, the world or God. And here's the problem. If you gain your value from the world, you have to base yourself on a world scale. And the world will judge you based on how successful you are, how good looking you are, how much money you make, how many followers you have. Do you have a blue tick next to your name? Because that's what our world is saying is value now. So you're going to subscribe to that value system. And when you base your self-love on that value system, you're in big, big trouble because that's for 1% of the population. And 1% of those people can say, yeah, well, that's me. And the rest of the world just has to look at them and go, oh, wow, I wonder what it'd be like to be them. Whereas the alternative is God and God values the heart. And God looks at the, the, what, what the weight of the heart is. And that's based on your actions, what you do as a person. That's why, like, you know, when I became 27 and I became a Christian, I went on this radical journey of understanding the true Jesus. Not the Jesus that the church presents, not the Jesus that modern day America presents, as in, like, God's going to bless you. And it's like, almost like an insurance policy. If I believe in God, I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to mm. get everything I'm going to get given to me, which is absolutely not what Jesus ever said. And what's really fascinating about Jesus, and I find most people don't understand this, is he never once offers happiness. Not once. In every single teaching, he never offers happiness. What he does offer is something the world will never be able to offer you, peace. Tell me who on social media offers you peace. We all say it's the pursuit of happiness. It's the pursuit of happiness. Go find happiness, go chase happiness. But the problem is when you pursue happiness, you leave a trail of destruction behind you. And that's what we find in our society today because it's all about me and my happiness. That's why Jesus comes along and says, yeah, you're going to be entering into a world that's completely broken. And the one thing you need more than happiness right now is peace. So my journey has been really, really interesting. And that's why I think social media is a funny thing. If you're presenting a message that's not you and it's not about you and it's not about the pursuit of happiness and it's not about, you know, living your best life in the right now, um, then I think it's awesome. If you're doing that, then you're just corrupting a generation. And we see that with these young people today. That was deep. Dude, it's super deep. And I, and, I, and I could talk about it all day long. And people come to me all day and said, no, you've got to love yourself before you can love others. And I asked them the question, what are you going to love about yourself if you haven't loved others first? You're going to love your hairstyle? You're going to love the way you look? You're going to love your job? That stuff becomes meaningless, you know? And I even, like, you know, I find I get really frustrated with um, modern day Christians. You know, I get into real conflict with Christians more than I do with non-believers because non-believers... Um, are not presenting a false truth. Whereas sometimes so many Christians in our, especially in a, you know, in a Western culture, they just have such a misconception of who Jesus is. And when you actually start subscribing to what Jesus actually said, which is the kingdom of heaven, it becomes a completely different thing. It's like this as a child. Um, and this, this is where I feel like most Christians never really grow and mature because they stay in that sort of infancy stage. When you're a kid, Christmas comes along. And what do you ask for? Presents. Toys. Give yeah. me toys. Give me the newest thing. Give me an <clears throat> iPad. Give me this. Give me that. I want all these like flashy little things. What happens when you get older? What do you start asking for for Christmas? Family to hang out with you. Yeah. Friendships, family, yeah. experience. Like, 
you know, like you want warmth and comfort and that, you know, and what you find is you meet Christians. And when you, if you see them asking God, like, God, give me a new job, give me a better car, give me like a new, give me the new boyfriend, the new girlfriend, give me something, give me, give me, give me. And what you start realizing is you haven't grown as a Christian. You're living in the infancy where you just want stuff from God. But when you actually mature, what you start saying to God is, God, teach me who you are. Show me your character. Show me your nature. Explain to me why this world is so broken. Explain to me why we're so corrupted as humans. And how do I break away from the systems of this world and all of a sudden become a citizen of your kingdom, which you're trying to introduce, which you're trying to take back because we've corrupted it so much. And when you meet those Christians who start saying, I don't want anything from God. I want to give back to God and I want to know who he is. Then you say, oh, they've matured. They're the real Christians. They're the ones who actually follow the message of Jesus, not the ones that just say, hey, yeah, I'm looking for the insurance policy and, you know, um, put my best foot forward, look good to the world, but change nothing of the heart, you know. What makes you, you do something on Sundays. What's, what do you call your Sunday Yeah, thing? so I got this little thing that I've started on YouTube called Palm Sundays because what I realize is so many Christians just don't understand the Bible and I get it. Like if I said to you right now, dude, read the Bible, you'll be fine. That's a lie. It's so complicated and it, there's so much But history. what makes you understand it? Because I, I spend six hours every day reading it and I go so deep. Like here's an example, um, the word church, right? In, in, in the Greek language, which was originally used uh, for the New Testament and, and you know, the, 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 the Tanakh and Torah was translated into the Greek at a certain point because all the Jews were speaking Greek at a certain point because it became this international language. The word for church is ekklesia right now we as a modern day people go oh, okay church i think of a building i think of an institution but the word ecclesia in the greek doesn't mean building or institution it means an invitation and what was happening when this idea of ecclesia is during like you know if you're in athens there would be an ecclesia there would be a calling out an invitation of a specific group of people to come and vote on something and they would go to this place called the agora uh, which I went to recently in, in, in um, modern day Greece. And you go to the Agora and they, they would vote on things. But what it is, is it's an invitation. So when Jesus talked about the church, he says, I'm inviting you out. I mean, I'm calling my people out, the people who want to follow me, the people who want to become the citizens of the kingdom of God. I'm calling you out to be different, different to the world. And what's interesting about that is the older I get, the more I say I don't want to partake in the world because the world is so broken. You know, you've had people like, you know, I've just recently gone through a breakup and unfaithfulness and you, you experience cheating and your heart gets broken. And as, as hard as that is to go through that suffering and that pain of rejection from another human, at the same time, it's amazing how God will use that suffering and say, Nathaniel, that's what the world is. Do you want to be a part of that? Do you want to partake in that? Do you want to go around hurting people like that? If you don't like it, then I'm calling you out. My invitation, my ecclesia to you is to come out, leave that and, and join the kingdom that I'm creating. But here's the thing about people and God. We want him to fix the world right now. Well, here's the problem. To fix the world, you've got to get rid of the people because we're the problem. So he's doing it one step at a time. And God's time is different to our time. So, you know, it's an interesting thing. But even just going into the Greek and understanding the language of the Greek starts making this so much more. So when people say to me, well, what church do you go to? I go, my church is my invitation from God to be a different citizen, to be part of his kingdom, not the kingdom of the world, which means he who is first is last. It means I'm going to serve before I start glorifying myself. Uh, so you don't go to church? I go to churches. Oh, okay. But I just, I don't subscribe to the modern day understanding of churches. Like, you know, like even, and it, well, you know, even another fascinating thing is like the Catholics, you know, Catholic people pray to Mary. And I'm sure there might be some Catholic people listening to this and they'll be like, oh, what are you going to say about the Catholics? <laughs> you know? So what you find is that like um, you go to the, the pagan Greek religion and they worshipped different gods. And one of these gods that they worshipped was Athena and she was the virgin, right? Now, there's nowhere in the Bible where Jesus says, pray to my mom. No, nowhere. And there's nowhere written in any scripture from any early church leader that says we're going to be praying to Mary because she's super, super important. Yes, Mary played a pivotal role in introducing Jesus into the world because she mothered him. So there would be both supernatural and natural coming in at the same time. Jesus had to enter the world and he had to be flesh, right? So she played an important role. But there is no reason that I should be praying to her. The only person I pray to is my God, my Father, my Heavenly Father. Um, and, and that's the interesting thing. But you see how religion takes this idea and it takes it from a pagan idea thousands of years ago praying to athena a perpetual virgin they go oh let's just make mary the perpetual virgin and we'll pray to her 
So we've, we're starting to do pagan things. Why? Because rituals and, and, and traditions are easy to do because my heart doesn't have to change. I can go to church every Sunday, but it doesn't mean I'm going to change as a human. And Jesus is saying, no, I want you to change as a human. But in order for you to change, your heart has to change. You have to start seeing the world differently. Because right now, if you don't subscribe to what God says, you see the world as everything you can see. And that's what's important to you. But God is saying this is all temporal. You're an amazing actor. I feel like you'd be, be a better priest. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's funny. People always say that to me. And what ends up happening, like I've been traveling through Europe, I'll get into four hour long conversations. That's what I was going to say. So my dad... Always told me, don't talk about politics and religion. Yeah. And here we are, we're talking about religion. <laughs> Welcome to the 21st and, century. Yeah, yeah. And my dad's a Catholic and he, we, yeah. our, our church is called St. Mary's. Right, there you so, go. Yeah, and look, it's I'm not, sure my dad would look, love to have a nine hour conversation yeah, with you right and, now. And I'm happy to have that conversation, you know what I mean? Because the first thing I'll say to him is just show me the verse in the Bible. <laughs> if you show me any verse in the Bible and you show me where it says that I pray to Mary, I'll be the first person to do it. Because I follow Jesus. I how follow do you, what he says. How do you, because uh, obviously like growing up as a kid, hated going to church. Yeah. yeah. Boring. Oh, yeah. How do you make religion, God, and all these things exciting? How do you make yeah. them the difference in the world that you know you want to change? Right, like, yeah. Because you said I can go to church every Sunday, Man, but I could you, not do anything. You live it, bro. You live it. But See, how do you, how do you, how do you bring that to people? Well, yeah. How do you bring that to people? Man, it's like, that's the thing, bro. Like, you know. Because I, I, I feel more now than ever, and it's it's it's. You're an anomaly because no mm. one in the entertainment world oh, too speaks of religion. They're too scared. Yeah, and they're I too scared that. because but it's, here's yeah. the thing: Jesus was radical, and Pe Jesus wasn't popular. And I'm not going to be popular based on this message. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to be popular. I can I can prove it because Jesus says I'm not going to be popular. He says they're going to hate you because they hated me first. And I get that. I get that because once someone says there's no choice, there's no other religion, there's no other option, all of a sudden you become the bad guy in the world mm -hmm. because the world wants freedom, the world wants choice, the world wants variety. Right? But if there is only one God and there is a creator of the universe, unfortunately, we don't get to choose that, you know. Um, and it's all even just like, you know, I was thinking this as I was driving in today. If, you know, if this conversation came up, you know, when we talk about value, you know, who decides value? Like if you're a piece of fruit in a, in, in a, in a marketplace, does the, does the banana say what value it is? Does the banana say I'm worth this much? Or does the, the shopkeeper say what your value is? the shopkeeper would say the value of this banana is this because i own it and i know it i grew it right um and that's where it comes back to like we always come back to these philosophical conversations who gives us value the world or god and i believe god gives us value but i, I believe that and the reason i know it works is because i i question it mark every day i'm not one of those christians who just blindly follows the reason i study my bible because i'm like i'm looking for the fault and i read other religions i've read the quran i you know i study judaism i hang out with rabbis you know i look into buddhism and hinduism and what the thing is you on the surface you'll see all these religions have similarities as soon as you talk about love people say love is love yeah but what is your definition of love you know we can all agree on the the superficial elements but when you get into the fundamental elements of a religion then you start having problems that's when you start realizing there's huge flaws in these belief systems and they will show at the very, very core of it. And but I then there's always the argument, who's to say that yours is right versus theirs is right versus theirs is right. right. It's like Democrats versus Republicans, totally, you know? Like totally. Well, what's going to last the test of time? What, like, See, here's the thing. I'll go to people, t tell me the flawed argument in Jesus' message. Tell me the flawed argument that, that I believe in a God that loved his creation so much that he wanted to... Think about your life. Everything's about relationship right everything mm -hmm. everything family friends partners everything is relationship based you are programmed to be in a relationship right now if you get to a certain point where like i do believe there is a god you have to ask this question does that god want a relationship and if that god does want a relationship how much of a relationship does that god want here's the beautiful thing about the idea of jesus becoming human if i was god and i loved my creation which was humanity so much and i wanted a personal relationship with them but I'm so big and I'm so vast. I'm so unexplainable, right? Words will never be enough to explain God. And if they were, then how limiting is God, right? Who creates the universe, the stars and the skies, the planets, our bodies, everything, the way everything works and moves and flows. You know, he's beyond our comprehension, but he wants a relationship with us. Yo, guys, I also interrupt this podcast to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Vistaprint. Vistaprint, Vistaprint, Vistaprint. We've talked about them many times before, guys. The importance of having a business card rather than giving out a phone number. The amount of times I've lost people's contacts because I don't remember what their name was. You got to have that tangible business card. It just... It, 
it really, it sets you apart from the rest of the competition when someone hands you a piece of stock. They got tons of stock. They got tons of designs you guys can pick from. All you got to do is upload your logo. Your satisfaction is 100% guaranteed, or they'll make it right either by reprinting your or order or offering a refund. As you guys already know, I'm hooking you guys up. They want you guys to be able to own the now in any situation, which is why our listeners will get 500 High quality custom business cards starting at $9.99. Just go to vistaprint.com slash large. That's vistaprint.com slash large. One more time. Vistaprint.com slash large. I think that's the hardest part. It's the hardest part. For me part. and most people, yeah. it's like, how do we, how do, we how do you it? believe in something how that we do don't, I? is not you tangible, can't you can't see. You can't but see, then obviously yeah. I have all these questions like, how are we perfectly exactly. formed? How are we a perfect distance from exactly. the sun? How are, do we have a universe? How do we have the sun heating us and yeah. like we don't burn to death no, and we don't freeze to death? It's unbelievable. It's, it, There's so many. You get to a point where you, 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 you the, the beautiful thing about faith is you're forced to believe something you can't see. There's, it, it always gets to that. But, but is that a certain level of crazy? No, because there's a truth to it, right? The reason we struggle so much with death is because we're not supposed to die. The Bible talks about that. The Bible says the original plan was that, you know, I, I talk to a lot of Christians and I, and I say to them, uh, what's the opposite of, uh, um, of heaven? And they say hell. And I go, well, hang on a second. The Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. There's no mention of hell at that point, right? Who created hell? We did. Separation from God. We separate from God, right? Which is that relationship. But here's the thing I was going to say. I believe in a God that does want relationship because you want relationship. You want relationship with people. You want relationship with friends. And you want relationship with some idea of a God, whether you're going to be controlled by it or it's going to control you ultimately. But here's the thing about Jesus. If God is real and he did want a relationship with humanity, then he humiliated himself. He was so big and so grand. And he said, I'm going to make myself so small and live a very, very normal human life so you can see how much I love my creation. And I'm going to come into this world and I'm going to die at the hands of the people I created to show you what kind of king I am. Because the kings we believe in today, the people we glorify today, would not die for you. They would not put anything above themselves, mm -hmm. right? And they're the people we follow. Right? Whereas Jesus is saying, I'm going to be a king like no other. And I'm going to come and I'm going to live the most humble life. And, and, the, and the beautiful thing about that is what form would God have to take if we were to even begin to understand the character and nature of God? For us, we're simple. We're human. We're, we, we live and we die, Mark. He would have to become a human so that we might understand him. He humiliated himself. Right. Right? So what's interesting is we love the, the Christmas story. We love the fact that, you know, uh, Jesus is a baby and everyone sort of celebrates Christmas on some level generally, you know. In, in Most Western religions culture. even still. Yeah, yeah, right? We like baby Jesus because baby Jesus doesn't tell us what to do. Jesus becomes a man and all of a sudden we stop listening. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. And what's the interesting thing about that is we can, uh, we, we, we celebrate this Christmas story. Okay, okay, God became human. But, but what happens when Jesus becomes a man? He says, now I want human to become like God. I want you to become perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. And that's when we stop. That's when we go, oh no, I'm out. You know, and even like this, I mean, there's so many things I could talk about, you know, with the Bible and, and how the Christian church has, has created this thing. It's like the Bible talks, uh, you know, a lot of Christian churches will have this message where it's like the, the unconditional love of God. God's love is unconditional, right? I don't believe that. I don't believe in unconditional love. No, neither do I. Unless it's, it's mother mother no, to but, son but but you know what even then it, it, there's a level right now because we all have values right, right. so there's are conditions that you, you conditions know? jesus says this. like if you shoot up heroin i'm yeah. not gonna like yeah you're like, not gonna be like hey you're cool i still you're all good i, I, I like you man yeah. but like so what, gotta go what we've, what, what we've created with this concept of unconditional love of god is we've become the narcissists we said god you're gonna love me regardless of my behavior that's just how it's gonna work you know but jesus doesn't say that jesus says if you loved me you would follow my, my commandments. So the call is not like the fact of the matter, the way I see it is God has already done enough in my life to prove that he loves me. I'm, I exist. I exist. Mm -hmm. I, I have a human existence, no matter how amazing or horrible that existence is. I'm alive and I experience things. And even in suffering, you can, st I've got to a place in my life where I'm like, whoa, I'm feeling something and it's painful and it hurts, but I'm feeling something. And that's, the gift that God's given us to feel and to have choice and to have freedom and to be able to love, right? Um, but the, but there is a condition. The condition is to be obedient to me, and you see that with the Jewish people. The do you think? Do you think with 
time and technology and the world changing mm. that so similar to like how the nation was built on the constitution right right you know gun laws and all right. that stuff we didn't have machine guns back in the day right. do you think similarly to the religion like things should be shifted over time with the change in culture and the change in the world uh what do you mean? Go, go explain a little bit more. In terms of like Ten Commandments oh, and, and no, stuff like, look, like that. The law, the law remains the same. Because we're reading a book that was written th- thousands of years thousands ago. Of years but ago. here's a go. Here, I'll give you an example of this. And I got into a discussion with an actor on a, on a show that I work on. And because um, he came in and he came into the room and he knows I'm a Christian. He goes, oh, you know, you believe in such a, 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 a prehistoric barbaric book, Nathaniel. And I said, okay, how, how do you figure? And, and he goes, oh, you know, they stone... You know, the stoning people for this and stoning people for that. And, and luckily enough, I'd read that chapter and I'd actually started to study it. It's in Exodus. And there's um, Moses gets given the law. Now, what you have to understand, there is context. God is giving a law to a group of people who have been slaves for 400 years under Egyptian oppression. So they've got a lot of bad habits. So God has to really start a, a nation, right? But what makes them bad habits? Bad habits? Well... I mean, they're, 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 but who designates the value? Like, you know, the well, bad like, habit. well, we know that murder is bad. Okay. You know, there's a bit of a, you know, if you killed someone, there, there should be some sort of thing that's written in your heart. You're like, inherently, I know that's not good. Mm-hmm. Someone's, something just died, right? So, like, so these three things that. But I, why? But why? Why is murder bad? Well, why do you Ma- think. Why? Animals kill other animals. Yeah, but they don't do it for sport. They don't. They 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 do it for survival. They do it for for food. They don't. They don't. They like humans. Humans kill for power, control, money. Different different motives. Yeah. Completely different motives. Jealousy, anger, rage. You you know you don't see an animal going. You know what? That wolf was looking at my wolf girlfriend last <laughs> week, so I'm just gonna rip him apart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they just have a different. Like there's a different level. I'm just of, playing devil's advocate. No, I know that's fine. <laughs> that's totally fine. So the three things. Here, let me give you these principles. The three things that are that, that are um, punishment by stoning in the Old Testament, right? God says uh, premeditated murder is a is a stoning offense. Committing adultery, a stoning offense, and um, cursing your mother and father is a stoning offense, right? Now, now someone will just read that who has no concept of context and history and culture and all that sort of stuff, and be like, oh, that's horrible, killing someone for for committing adultery or killing someone for you know murder. Or so kill- it was an eye for an eye. Well, yeah, but but here's the thing. Um, there's 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 what what you have to understand is like what what god is setting is principles because we need principles we need boundaries we need to understand those things god is saying number one don't think about the punishment first think about what god's saying number one human life is valuable and i say human life is valuable so don't take it it's not your right it's not your privilege to take human life so if you do it know that you're killing something and the 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 consequence to that should be your death because you've killed something and that's not right, right? Number two, adultery, right? The, the, the breaking of a union of a relationship, right? Now, I don't know if you've ever been cheated on. I've been cheated on twice, right? Um, that kills something on the inside. Mm-hmm. And the pain and the suffering that I've gone through from unfaithfulness has broken me on a level that I can't even explain with words, right? But God acknowledges that if someone does that to you, that is like killing someone. And you've killed something that I said is special, right? The third thing is cursing your mother and father, which is kind of like, whoa, that's extreme. Like how many kids would be like, whoa, if we're living on that system. But what God is saying is the principles, I put uh, a mother and father in a position to lead a family and and family is really, really important. So honor them, honor the position I put people in. Here's what's interesting, Mark. Murder, committing adultery and cursing your mother and father, right? We lose any one of those things in our society. We start breaking them down and look what we have outside, right? How unfaithful people are today, the problems that creates in the world, murder, people killing for just to to get ahead, to make money, to make profit, to take advantage, to control, to consume, you know, and even just like the position of parents, how weak have parents become? Mm -hmm. We're all broken. And God's saying, you lose one of those three things, society rips apart. So I have to set really strict rules and I have to have really strict um, punishments not for you to, to suffer, but for you to understand how important these three things are in a society. Because if any one of them falls apart, then goodbye. It doesn't work. And that's what we're looking at in our world today. How many, I grew up without a dad. How much has that affected my life? How many kids, and I don't even understand what the concept of love is anymore. And even like my ex-girlfriend, she grew up in a broken home as well. And you go, do I blame her? 
for what she did to me? Or do I say, wait a second, she's just a product of our broken society. And God said, if we break any one of these things, it's just going to get worse and worse. And I go around the world and I see broken kid and broken kid and broken kid. And I'm like, there's a reason for that. Because we stopped listening to what God said is special. We stopped listening to what he said is holy and important. And that's the thing. So that's when I go to the Bible and someone comes along to me. And I, then I said to this, this guy, I said, why are you so against adultery? Because that was the thing he was against. I was like, well, do you want to cheat on your wife? Is that why you just want freedom to cheat? Is that why you have a problem with the stoning issue? Because if you don't have a problem with the stoning of, a, of adultery, you know, you have, like, if you're faithful, you have nothing to worry about. Right. Do you know what I mean? The problem is presented in the human spirit right there consequences we don't want to have consequences we don't want to be responsible for our actions and god is saying no hang on a second there's valuable things in this world and i've created things for a reason and there's consequences when you break those things and you need to understand that because if you don't then you can't be like me and i want you to be perfect like me because that's how i want the world to be and that's what jesus came to do to change it i gotta say you're really convincing. You're really good at, at speaking like what you believe in. Man, I, I live it. I love it. You know? And look, dude, I would love to... There's nothing more... Like, I'm not very... I'm not educated enough to sit of here course. and argue back of at course, you. You know, I'm course. sure my dad would. I'm sure of George course. would. Of like, course. yeah. People, a lot of people that study the Bible of course they are can. probably going to rage in the comments. <laughs> yeah, and look, and that's great. Look, I'm happy for people to be upset or even just start talking about it. But the, but the ultimate thing is this. What am I fighting for here? A better world, right? Is, like, do you not? Do you not want that? Oh, of course. Like, I think the world. Who wants more pain? Shit, right now. More suffering. Yeah. Who wants like we glorify unfaithfulness? These, Murder. Yeah. All we, these mass shootings. You got. Um, we become so, divorce yeah, rates. We become so desensitized to it. Where we like even like my my opinion on abortion. You know, and here's another big. Oh, one we, we, we're yeah. not gonna get into that because yeah, we're actually about to yeah, about to wrap, to wrap up. up. Yeah. But I was gonna say like yeah, the rates of every like. It's look. It's like I, I I can't tell you the last time I've met someone that either doesn't have divorced parents, yeah, or my heart. father left. Yeah. like yeah. I've my parents have been married forty something years, and when I tell people that, they're like, it's, "Wow, it's rare. It's rare. It's like, rare. Yeah." <laughs> and and like, look, think about that. You know, we think love is the feeling. No, love is not the feeling. Love is the choice. And and what makes that your parents' relationship so valuable is the forty years. It's not the first three weeks. Right. It's the 40 years that they said, I choose you, you choose me, and we're together. And we've lost that. And these young people are losing that because what are we saying to them? Love yourself. Does That person doesn't work for you? Get out. Find someone else. Yeah. Move on. It's your life. There's no fighting anymore. Pursuit of happiness. And I yeah. hate that. Don't believe in the pursuit of happiness. It's a lie. The pursuit of happiness leaves a, a trail of destruction. That's what I believe. Self-love is not real. You need to find where the love of God comes from. Your value comes from him. And he doesn't look at you like someone who's at the bottom of the food chain. He looks at you as a valuable creation that he has created. And you have so much more purpose than what the world will ever say you do. And that's why I love the Bible, bro. You know, And I'll, I'll preach it and teach it as much as I possibly can. Um, and if people don't like that, that's cool. Because you know what? The freedom is you get to do what you want. Yep. You know? Which I kind of also say, hey, good for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. It was yes, actually, it was fun. I'm sure we could sit here and talk for four <laughs> hours about this. Oh, we could, yeah. Uh, guys, check him out. I'll put all the socials down below. Check out Vampire Diaries if you haven't already. Let's see if we can get him on another movie or TV show very, very soon. Yeah. I wanted to talk more about that, but we got I'm into the sorry. religion talk for yeah, so long. I told you, bro. Yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, I'm having the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Flock, Mark Manson, on the show. Um, it's going to be a good one, guys. We'll see you then. Oh, yeah.